What's up, everybody? We are back. John Della Rose here. DellaRose.com. That's D-E-L-A-R-R-O-Z.com. Coming at you with another Star Trek graphic novel collection review. Uh, this is volume number nine, which they actually don't put the volume number anywhere but the back. So you can check that out. And The Early Voyage is part one. And I believe this is an IDW title uh, originally. And IDW is uh, printing these for... Eagle Moss collections for this whole graphic novel collection. Now, this is uh, a collection which is reprinting basically every Star Trek graphic novel ever, uh, minus some. It just got canceled, unfortunately, about 10 volumes too soon. Very sad. But uh, you get a beautiful, beautiful hardcover book with, with this matching spines and awesomeness on the side. I wasn't sure what to make about this one. You obviously see, see Chris Pike on the cover with uh, the original Enterprise. And so we get to dive right into what this is. Cool. All right. This is The Early Voyages. And so this is by Ian Eddington and Dan Abnett. Dan Abnett is famous for his Warhammer stuff and for uh, he actually did a really good Guardians of the Galaxy run also. And pencils by Patrick Zercher, Michael Collins, and Javier Polito. I guess, I wonder if he's really related to Brian Pluto. Interesting. Uh, and then inks by Greg Adams, Steve Moncus, and colors by Marie Javins and Matt Webb. Now, the concept of this is this takes place uh, in the Captain Pike era of the Starship Enterprise. You get your number one uh, first officer. You get that old, kind timey medical guy. And they, and they actually rounded out the crew with a couple other characters in here that they bring into this. And I'm so excited. This actually worked really well. This felt very Star Trek-y. Every issue has its own story to it. Look at this layout. Very cool right here. Beautiful job uh, of the bridge and, and, and tilting that perspective just enough to make it really entertaining. In this first one, they get trapped with this, like, monster thing that's feeding off human energy, basically. Really love the design of Captain Pike here. Gosh, gorgeous art. I like this art style. Um, and... Uh, it helps them relive their history. So you can see acquainted with all the characters, how they came aboard the Enterprise. And he's basically trying to, that creature's trying to get the memories of Captain Pike uh, so that it can uh, infiltrate Earth and, and all that and, and bring them down. So really fun. They eventually beam over to the, the animal creature. Look at this design for this monster. Very cool. This is it might be my favorite issue of Star Trek stuff I've read so far. And they bring uh, Captain Pike back. So high praise for that. Good stuff right there. The mothership still going on. So they go back to the thing's mothership and uh, and blow it up because that's what you do. Awesome stuff. All right. Issue number two. And you get the Enterprise at a station. These Klingons are, are showing up in the area. There's like this dilithium mining processing sort of deal. Look at this. Even the starships and the worlds are just... Very sci-fi and cool. Very well very well done. This, uh, I think Patrick Zercher did both these two first issues. I need to look up more of his artistic stuff. Cause did he do the first one also? It was also Patrick Zercher. Yeah. Gosh, I'm super impressed by this Patrick Zercher guy. <laughs> I will be looking him up after, after this video. And uh, it introduces this Klingon who, uh, as, it, as it says in the intro here, becomes a recurring character that Captain Pike has to deal with uh, over, the co over the course of this. And he gets... Uh, he gets spanked by Captain Pike and his crew. Uh, very, very fun. Very good uh, Star trek -y episode here. Uh, Patrick Zercher on the third issue also. And we have this world where they are uh, seeing their old barbaric past. This is a crowd scene. You don't get a lot of crowd scenes. I think the colors did this page a little bit of a disservice because the colors made it so there's really, it is very overcrowded in a lot of ways as it is. But the colors made it so there's really not much of a focal point. Maybe, maybe this thing here. That makes it a little, little difficult to kind of parse out what's going on through this. So it's not not perfect. but uh, And they're a warlike group who's going to join the Federation, and Captain Pike and company are hanging out. And uh, in this one, they uh, actually kill uh, a guy established in the first issue, who's uh, Yeoman Cusack, who is Captain Pike's friend here. And... Um, that, that makes the big drama out of this. This is a weaker issue than the first two in terms of uh, what goes on, but but they are... Um, oops. But they, they do basically uh, uh, root out this whole plot of people who don't actually want to join the Federation and change their ways or whatever. 
and and that's that's the the fallout of it. it the, the emotional impact was the the killing of Cusack, and and uh, and that actually um, made it so it was a little bit more because it was a little little thin of a plot compared to the others. Now for the next issue, this has a weird scan to it. I don't know what happened here, but I, I don't know if you can see it right here, but it, it's a little blurry in the printing here. Um, and this is actually uh, a reference back to the cage. And it's from the perspective of this redhead gal who is actually uh, in the episode. And she comes aboard and she's actually having trouble because she's supposed to be replacing that Cusack guy as Yeoman. And uh, and then she gets caught up in this whole deal with Captain Pike and the Telosian. So it's a nice callback to that episode. It also sets the time frame of where we're at exactly in here compared to the others uh, for the fourth issue here. So she kind of comes back and she starts to feel like she's part of the crew. This whole This whole issue really felt funky like it wasn't quite scanned right i don't know what happened here um but maybe it's just the colors but i think the printing was an issue on this didn't didn't deter the enjoyability it was a it was a nice um nice issue you know i mean all those like uh tie-ins that really reference other episodes and things like that don't quite uh hold my interest as much as as new stuff does but uh, I, I liked that this was inserted here at this point not, and not the first one. So we got a couple adventures, kind of got to know people and then uh, and then figured out exactly where we were sort of in the timeline here. And I look forward to this. This is a great series. This is probably the best, like I said at the beginning, the best Star Trek I've read so far out of all this stuff. And I might actually skip because I've been reading these in order, uh, but I got about 40 volumes of this now. And I might actually skip and, and just continue on to part two, which they don't do the books in order for these things. They have Early Voyages Part 1, but Part 2 is actually about 10 books off. They, they kind of give you a smattering of things. So uh, I might go to that because uh, I just enjoyed this so much. It was so well done. Now to Gold Key. Ha ha. All right. Every one of these books in Star Trek, uh, as I mentioned, every one of these videos has a Gold Key issue from the 1960s in here also. And now we're up to number nine with Volume 9, which is very exciting. The Legacy of Lazarus. And this one is written by Len Wein, who's a, 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 the creator of Wolverine. Uh, he is a legend, so uh, great stuff. And on this one, they go to a planet where there's uh, all these androids that are made of all these historical figures like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Roman emperors, etc. And they, they talk to the robot maker. He seems like an all right guy, and then he eventually kidnaps Spock. <laughs> and I actually, I love the way these panels are, are done uh, by this artist here with the with the white gutters with no no real lines around it. It's so clean looking. And, you know, there's nothing really crossing over. It's, it is a big contrast with, between this and the, the modern style uh, where, you know, there's, you just kind of put as much stuff on the page as possible and just fill every ounce of space. I feel like this just, just feels better for storytelling. Uh, and I love this classic Silver Age style a lot better. But basically, he wants Spock's experiences, and so he wants Spock's brain. And, uh, and is going to just uh, rip everything out of there in order to, to get Vulcan culture uh into his little like robot society of, of these historical figures. Uh, and eventually, you know, of course they fight and the guy falls into his own machine. This is pretty poorly done uh, because you don't actually get a great uh, perspective of where he's running and they kind of tell you what happened rather than showing you a lot of what happened there. Um, but whatever, you know, nitpicking a little bit, but I had a ton of fun with this. Uh, this was really zany and cool. Like all of these gold key have been so far. And uh, I, I really love, love the Silver Age Star Trek stuff. Now, this is the first issue also of Gold Key that I've seen that they really, like, they dialed in and, like, got Star Trek right. In the ones before this, they, they kind of just, like, it didn't quite feel like it. Like, it, I, I, what it says in here in the introductions is that they were actually um, working off of not, av not having actually seen the episodes. And, and by this the time this one came out, they actually had seen it and were able to actually write to what they had seen on the TV. So they got the phasers a little better. They got the technology a little better. The background's a little better. And uh, and it just it just is dialed in right here. All right. This is a 9 out of 10. Uh, this was some of my favorite reading of the last month. Very enjoyable. Hit that like and subscribe button. We'll be back soon.